Um, well, it's so wonderful to see so many people here. This will be our third um, annual celebration of Food Day here at ISU, and the GPSA program has helped put these events together, and this is by far our largest event, so we're um, probably at almost 350 people right now, so thank you. I'm so happy that all of you find this relevant to be here as well. Um, so Food Day is a nation nationwide movement for healthy, affordable, and sustainable food. Um, this is an independent effort. It's not funded by government or industry. In 2011, uh, we hosted a local, a local forum on the consumer's role in the food system. And last year, um, we welcomed leaders like the Korean Women Peasants Association, and they, uh, they were recent winners of the Food Sovereignty Prize. Uh, like tonight, all of these events have been the results of fruitful collaborations with other campus and community organizations. This year, we had the opportunity to welcome Francis Moore LaPay, the author of Diet for a Small Planet, and two farmers from Africa, Harriet Nakambali and Kajuli Kalia. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Ms. Howder in what is easily um, largest event uh, food day. Sorry, I'm moving my script around a little bit. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a little bit more information about uh, Ms. Howder. Uh, she's currently the executive director of Food and Water Watch. She's worked extensively on food, water, energy, and environmental issues at the state and local level, as well as the federal level. She currently lives in DC and works for Food and Water Watch there. She recently wrote a book, Foodopoly, The Battle Over the Future of Food and Farming in America. And please make sure you grab a copy on your way out tonight. And she'll be discussing much of what's in that book tonight as, as a bit of a primer. Um, and it, she has experience in developing policy positions and legislative strategies. She's also skilled and accomplished organizer, having lobbied and developed grassroots field strategy and action plans. She, she's held many interest, interesting and engaged positions as the director of Public Citizens Energy and Environment Program, which focused on water, food, and energy policy, and to also working as environmental policy director for Citizen Action um, and senior organizer of the Union of Concerned Scientists. We welcome Ms. Howder to ISU's campus and look forward to the conversation that she will develop here tonight and into the future. So thank you all for coming and let's welcome Ms. Howder. You know you're getting old when people start calling you Miss. <laughs> Anyway, I am thrilled to be here in Ames. Iowa is one of my favorite states. And I'm just wondering how many of you are here tonight because your professor told you to come or you have to write something. I'm just interested in, okay. Well, I'm gonna try to make it interesting for everybody and I'm gonna be a little bit provocative. So I'm gonna start out by telling you a little bit about myself. So when I was 11, my parents, who were missionaries, decided that it was time to get back to the farm. My dad had grown up in the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma, and um, he still had some romantic um, ideas about farming. And he actually had been an early subscriber to the Rodale Press's uh, organic gardening. So my parents didn't have much money, but uh, they put together their resources and bought a really funky farm outside of Washington, D.C., about 45 miles away. Um, now, in those days, uh, D.C. was a sleepy little town, a very small population, and it was like being really out in the country. And our driveway was a mile long. We had almost knee-deep ruts in the driveway and needed a dump truck to get in and out. I don't think my father had really a thought about that. And my dad wasn't much into creature comforts, so uh, he never bothered to put the uh, central heat in this uh, old farmhouse that nobody had lived in for decades and never bothered to put the plumbing in. Now, I did learn a lot about uh, um, the hard work of farming. I was an only child. It was my job to chop kindling. And um, I plucked chickens, squeezed potato bugs, and I can tell you, I could not wait to get away from that farm when I was 18 years old. But I think I learned a lot of my most valuable lessons 
uh, in uh, growing up on a farm. And a lot of the values that I have today come from that time. And I'm very lucky. I'm an only child who inherited a 100-acre farm 45 miles outside of Washington, D.C., that my husband retired about 15 years ago to run a community-supported agriculture program because we have a very large population today. So I live part-time on the farm, but the traffic is so bad that uh, I have to live part-time in the city. So there are a lot of trade-offs to that very large population. Now, one of the reasons that I wrote Foodopoly uh, and there are a number of reasons that I'll mention tonight, but it's the whole idea that farmers are somehow going to uh, start doing direct sales and uh, um, you know just give up the big tractors and uh, start growing vegetables. And I've been speaking in classes all day, and I've said several times, I think it's going to be really hard in Iowa uh, to compete with California in growing vegetables. And I don't see where the uh, infrastructure, the tractors, and all of the equipment is going to come from. So I think we better um, have some farm policies that really make it possible for us to transition the kind of agriculture that we do so that farmers can make a living and so that we have a healthy food system. So tonight, I'm going to ask all of you young people who are sitting in the back and have to be here uh, to be kind of patient with me because I want to talk about some farm policy history, uh, that I think it's really important that anybody who's interested in agriculture that's doing any aspect of agriculture uh, at university actually um, knows about. And I don't think a lot of this history is actually taught in school anymore. Because, you know, if we need to know where we're going right, we kind of need to know where we've been. So I'm going to start before World War and please don't roll your eyes about this, but uh, many of you in the front rows <laughs> will remember that uh, we were in a real economic crisis in the 1920s in this country. And a lot of the same players that recently uh, brought our economy to a crashing halt uh, those same kinds of economic players, the financial services industry, had also uh, uh, misbehaved and uh, created the uh, economic conditions that caused the Great Depression. And so when the Roosevelt administration came into office in the early 1930s, one of the things that they were trying to do was to improve life not just in urban areas for workers, but to actually improve the economic conditions in rural areas. And at that time, 54% of the population lived on farms. And you have to remember that the first five years of the 1930s, uh, we lost one-sixth of all farms at that time. But we still had about 6.8 million farms. So what I want to talk about tonight is what happened um, in the Roosevelt administration that really helped agriculture and how over the past uh, several decades those policies have been eliminated really hurting agriculture, the farmer's ability to make a living and uh, you know created a food system that is both uh, in many ways making people sick and overweight. So what the Roosevelt administration um, decided to do was uh, to create some policies that would actually make it possible for farmers to make a living. And most of you probably know that the Secretary of Agriculture during the first two Roosevelt terms uh, came from Iowa. His name was Henry Wallace. And he uh, um, knew a lot about agriculture and knew a lot of the things that needed to be done. Now, the, the problem for farmers has always been and continues to be today actually making the cost of production uh, and then making a profit on top of the cost of production. So the Roosevelt administration came up with a number of common sense policies that made it possible for 
agriculture to thrive, rural communities to thrive, and for food to be a, a reasonable price and for consumers to have a, a access to a healthy food system. Um, they did things like uh, create programs that um, were a price floor, created a price floor for farmers so that the farmers could actually uh, get back the cost of production. And they did this through some wonky things that we're not going to go into tonight, but involved having a grain reserve. You know, China's had a grain reserve since 54 AD. Uh, the grain reserve uh, was actually filled during good years. Um, there was a loan program. Farmers could take out loans. And then if the companies that were buying uh, the grains didn't pay a decent price, uh, they could sell their grain uh, to the government and store it on their farms on a grain reserve, which served to actually dramatically stabilize prices, something that hadn't happened. It was a supply management tool. There were other programs that, that helped manage supply so that the price of agricultural products for farmers was um, something that actually allowed them to have what was called parity uh, with urban workers, or they were paid on par with urban workers you know, it's kind of like a living wage for, for farmers. Um, millions of acres of marginal land were taken out of production at this time, land that shouldn't have been, uh, had crops being grown on it, and a number of other programs. Uh, it's worth going back, if you're an ag student, and looking at some of these Depression-era uh, farm uh, programs, which I think uh, would benefit agriculture today if we reestablished some of these supply uh, mechanisms. So um, things worked pretty well during World War II, and probably all of you know from your history lessons that during World War II, uh, the U.S. provided food really for all of the allies as Europe was being devastated. And after the war, when Europe was really uh, in a shambles, and a lot of the colonial governments around the world were falling because of the changes that had taken place during the war, the U.S. was still providing food at a reasonable price. And at that time, rural communities were pretty much thriving. Uh, farmers were growing food, uh, a lot of their sons, because of course at that time uh, it was young men going into farming. I know some uh, young women are going into farming today. But at that time, um, that point of history, young men were coming back from World War II and taking over their family farms. And um, things were working pretty well. But not everybody was very happy with uh, the situation with young men coming back from the war, going back into agriculture. Because a lot of things had really changed during the war, and these are all things we know and have read about. The U.S. had become an industrial powerhouse, a manufacturing powerhouse. The center of finance had moved from New York to, uh, or from London rather, to New York. And uh, the U.S. was really beginning to change. And there were a group of industrial leaders who believed that agriculture was the old way, that it was bad public policy to have all of these small farms, and that there needed to be major changes that actually drove young men out of rural communities into urban areas to uh, provide the labor for the growing industries, especially uh, in the northern United States. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is some kind of really weird, wild conspiracy. I'm saying that this is business leaders who get together in their clubs, who talk uh, on their, uh, in the different board, interlocking um, directorships for different companies, who socialize together. Uh, there was just a, a feeling that there needed to be a lot more labor and you know, cheap labor, to be honest, when you go back and read those documents from the past. Now, one of the organizations that was formed at this time uh, to lobby uh, to really uh, increase the size of farms and to drive agriculture 
uh, and food processing more towards vertical integration. One of these organizations is very interesting, and uh, uh, you can actually find some of their reports on the internet today. It's called the Committee for Economic Development. And a number of very influential people got together to put this uh, organization uh, into operation. One of them was an, a man by the name of Paul Hoffman, who was the um, uh, president of Studebaker, one of the largest car firms of the time. Uh, another, uh, his name was uh, Marion Folsom. He was a uh, executive at Kodak Eastman. Another of the individuals was named William Hoffman. He was on the cutting edge of consumer research and how advertising can actually change people's minds. And these were the three uh, initial uh, organizers of this Committee for Economic Development. And they believed that uh, there was what they called excess labor in farming and that uh, um, there, these New Deal policies, these 1930s policies that were allowing small, diversified farms to thrive were really old-fashioned, that the country really needed to get rid of these New Deal programs. And they set about putting together a strategy for doing this. And um, it's kind of interesting, this organization in the first 15 years of its existence 38 of its members held uh, public office. Uh, two of its members um, were Federal Reserve Bank ch uh, chairs. And uh, these were very influential and high-placed individuals who had a lot of influence. Now, they began to be able to chip away at these New Deal policies under the Eisenhower administration. Um, there was a, an individual who was Secretary of Agriculture during part of the uh, Eisenhower administration named Ezra Benson. Now, Ezra Benson was an ideologue, and uh, he believed that these New Deal policies that were allowing smaller farms to thrive, that allowed rural areas to really thrive, were uh, um, driving the country towards communism. Don't laugh, it's the truth. Uh, and you'll remember that um, this was the period in U.S. history uh, when the McCarthy hearings were going on and there was a lot of concern about communism. Now, I don't know if he really believed that or not, but he was very aligned with the largest agribusinesses um, and food processors and uh, largest companies in uh, the United States at that time. So he began to use his position to chip away a bit at those parity programs that let farmers make a living on par uh, with urban workers. And uh, meanwhile, the Committee for Economic Development and a lot of the other actors in society who wanted to get a, rid of these New Deal programs were organizing and using their influence. And by the uh, early 1960s, the Committee for Economic Development had become a very large and influential organization. And in 1962, um, there were two uh, chairs of the Committee for Economic Development. One of them was the uh, president of Ford, and the other was the president of Sears. And uh, they had been able to attract most of the titans of industry, most of the big publishing houses, um, the economics departments of the most prestigious universities in the country. And they put out a report called an adaptive plan for agriculture. And the whole um, mission of this report was to make the case that the New Deal farm programs that were uh, allowing farmers to make uh, uh, the cost of production, even though it had been chipped away in the uh, 1950s, um, the grain reserve and all of the other policies um, really didn't make economic sense, uh, weren't efficient. That's when we started to hear efficiency uh, a lot uh, in the economics departments. And that really it was uh, time to get rid of those um, New Deal farm policies. 
And the uh, 18 economics departments actually helped write that report. And I actually got a copy of it on the internet. I mean, these, a lot of these documents, you don't have to uh, uh, go to a research institution. A lot of them today, you can actually Google and, uh, uh, and find out this information. Now, um, going to move ahead to the 1970s because that's uh, when a lot of the really dramatic changes uh, began to happen. Although we did lose half of all farms between 1950 and 1970, before the real uh, agricultural crisis uh, began in the 1970s. Now I want to mention a, a number of things that happened under um, the Nixon administration. And I want to say up front that I'm going to pick on both political parties tonight, uh, even though I'm starting with uh, Richard Nixon, because really there's been total agreement on a lot of these issues between both parties. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But under Richard Nixon, one of Ezra Benson's protégés became Secretary of Agriculture. And most of you are too young to remember Earl Butts. But you know, uh, even I, I see people uh, kind of smiling because anybody who knows about him kind of smiles because he was such a character. Uh, I remember him because, of course, in those days, um, in the 1970s, um, we had, depending on where you lived, four or five TV channels, right? And uh, at dinner time, um, lots of families uh, sat down and watched the evening news while they were eating dinner. And uh, Earl Butts would often be on the evening news because he had a really big ego. I mean, I bet most people today wouldn't even know um, that Secretary Vilsack is secretary. I mean, you could walk down the street. Maybe here in Iowa people do, but in most states, nobody would. Well, everybody knew who the Secretary of Agriculture was in those days because he had such a, a big ego. And uh, he um, used his position to tell farmers that they needed to adapt or get out. They needed to get big or get out. They needed to borrow a lot of money um, and buy a lot of land and equipment or rent a lot of land uh, because the U.S. was going to become the grain-producing capital of the world. Well, there was only one year during the 1970s that the U.S. Uh, had an export market for grain. And that was the year that Earl Butts arranged it for uh, President Nixon's uh, election uh, against George McGovern. I know this is ancient history. I see some of you in the back looking at each other. I will say that's the first election I voted in. But anyway, uh, uh, Earl Butts uh, was very concerned and the, um, the people around Nixon that a lot of farmers were going to vote for George McGovern because, of course, at that time, especially in the South, lots of, well, everybody voted Democratic. So the idea was to put uh, together a, this grain deal that would allow farmers to make a lot of money and then maybe they'd like uh, Richard Nixon and vote for him. And so uh, um, taking the lead of Cargill, uh, ADM, and some of the other grain um, traders, a big deal was put together with the Soviet Union, uh, which um, was slightly illegal at the time. Um, and um, the, the Soviet Union had had a big grain failure, and a very large percentage of U.S. grain uh, went to the Soviet Union that year, made about $2 billion for the grain traders, which was a lot of money in those days. And the next year, the price of bread went up. But by that time, uh, Richard Nixon had been uh, uh, reelected. Now, there was no grain market um, for the rest of the 70s, even though farmers did start um, borrowing a lot of money, often using the farm as collateral, buying lots of equipment, you know, listening to the USDA and the experts about the direction to go. And what happens when there's no market for your grain and you've borrowed a lot of money and you've put your farm up as collateral? Well, eventually you lose your farm. And, and that was really the, um, the beginning of the very 
painful and dramatic uh, agricultural crisis that I know some of your families and some of you probably lived through in the 1970s and going into the 1980s. Now, um, a number of other things had also begun to change in the 1970s. There was a lot of pressure to allow companies to get bigger, much, much larger. And the excuse of the day was, well, we have to compete with Japan. It was Japan in those days. And uh, to be competitive, we really need our corporations to, uh, to be able to get very large. And there was also a lot of pushback about the social and cultural and political changes that had taken place in the 1960s uh, that were not just cultural, but a lot of our major environmental laws were actually passed in the early 1970s under the Nixon administration. And there was a lot of pushback uh, from a lot of the industries that were being regulated uh, by these new laws and a real desire to uh, kind of take back uh, the regulatory system. So one of the things that uh, Richard Nixon did that I think uh, had a big impact on even society today and certainly has had a lot of impact uh, on um, our economic system is he uh, appointed to the Supreme Court uh, an individual named Lewis Powell. Now Lewis Powell was uh, a corporate lawyer and uh, he was on the board of about 11 uh, different corporations. And he was a very uh, perceptive and strategic thinker. And uh, uh, two months before he was nominated to be a Supreme Court Justice, he wrote a memo to um, one of his friends who was in the leadership of the Chamber of Commerce, one of the uh, most influential uh, political organizations in this country. And he said that it was time for industry, and not just the food industry, he was talking about all industry, to fight back against all of this regulation and the political and social and cultural changes that had taken place. It was time for them to organize their money, uh, get involved in universities, uh, take back universities, uh, take back the political system by uh, giving money, campaign contributions, create their own infrastructure uh, that would write reports, do media work, that would talk about all of the, uh, 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 the problems of regulation and would really promote the economic interests of corporations. And this memo came to light after about 15 or 20 years, you know, as public documents uh, begin to uh, uh, actually uh, uh, become transparent. And you can go to the internet today, and I would encourage anybody who's not familiar with this memo to Google Powell Memo and, uh, um, and read about, you know, really the strategic thinking uh, about how to uh, create a political system that I would say has kind of hijacked our democracy. And what happened as uh, a result of this is that a number of um, very wealthy people and large corporations did get together and begin pooling their money and raising money. And um, they, their candidate was um, uh, Ronald Reagan. Now, already the, the Democratic Party was also beginning to take campaign money. I always say, you know, the Democrats are a little cheaper to buy, right? Uh, when you're talking about politics being for sale. But anyway, uh, the oil industry uh, was one of the uh, very active industries at this time, and we know the oil industry is very important for agriculture, uh, but also the, uh, the grocery industry and a number of very large industries. What, they weren't just interested in kind of the deregulation that we usually think of, environmental deregulation. Top on their agenda was getting rid of the nation's antitrust laws. Now, I think it's important that we all recognize that there has been in our nation a debate about um, who should have the power in society since this nation was founded. 
This was a debate between Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson won that round. And we've seen over the course of the nation's history a real debate and discussion about how large economic interests should be allowed to get. And we all know about the trust busting of uh, the Teddy Roosevelt era. And um, I mean, this has been a, a continuing debate. So the, the modern piece of this debate and actually the um, evisceration of antitrust laws began under the Reagan administration. It was finished under the Clinton administration. But let me uh, uh, start with what happened in uh, 1981. So after President Reagan was elected, uh, what you would expect happened. The, uh, if you want to get rid of antitrust laws, that means that you have to uh, impact the agencies that oversee these laws. And uh, several agencies are involved, but the, the two most important are the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice. Now, in writing Foodopoly, I actually had the pleasure of talking to uh, one of the commissioners from the Federal Trade Commission at this time. His name's Michael Perchuk, and he's actually uh, retired in uh, the Southwest. Uh, and he told me about uh, a document that I should read. It was a 400-page report to Congress that he and a colleague, he had been a, a Jimmy Carter appointee, but his colleague was uh, a uh, Nixon-appointed um, commissioner. And you have to remember that from the 1940s through the end of the 1970s, both political parties in this country agreed that strong antitrust uh, law was important for making our economic system work. And so it was really shocking to these commissioners when um, these uh, Reagan appointees came in and, you know, did what you would expect if you want to uh, make an agency uh, ineffective, dramatically cut the budget, cut the staff, got rid of whole departments, fired a lot of the lawyers, and I think most importantly, narrowed the definition of what an antitrust violation is. And every administration since then has been afraid to really um, make even the uh, weak antitrust provisions that are in law to actually uh, enforce them, all administrations. And um, so this had the effect that you might expect. What happens when companies are allowed to get as big as they want? And you know, we've had a flurry of mergers and acquisitions um, beginning, really beginning in the 70s, but then into the 80s, into the 90s, continuing today. And probably no industry has been as affected as food and agribusiness, where we have such a few players in every aspect of it that control the industry. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes when we're kind of uh, done with this historical overview. So this began to shift uh, political power and to change elections. This is when we really began to see the push to make um, elections, I mean, I'm going to say it as it is, uh, kind of for sale. So we have this system of legalized bribery today where whoever can raise the most money uh, basically in most elections wins. And that really began during that period uh, of the 1980s going into the 1990s. Now, with um, the growing influence of corporations and the desire to get bigger, to have more control, and to have an international scope, we began to see the pressure for the trade agreements that have done so much to change our society and our food system. Uh, and have, you know, resulted in the offshoring of jobs and the further real crippling of industrial areas and really of uh, rural areas as well. Um, and there were, when we're talking about the food industry, um, some companies that had a really brilliant strategy about how to 
get a hold of these negotiations and to benefit from them. And so uh, um, when the Clinton administration came into office, um, they were uh, very enthusiastic about these trade agreements and actually uh, um, kind of tore the Democratic Party uh, apart over the debate over these trade uh, agreements. And uh, some companies like Cargill began to put together a, uh, a strategy that was, um, you know, like I said, pretty smart. Now, in the past, food-related companies and agribusiness had had a really difficult time in speaking with one voice. There, you know, everybody was interested in kind of their parochial part of the business and a lot of arguing amongst themselves. So Gar Cargill, um, the leadership there, put together a coalition of 100 different companies to sit down and uh, between themselves in private to debate what kind of trade policy uh, would be most beneficial to all of them and what they could agree upon so that they could speak with one voice in this very uh, controversial debate over uh, trade, but really, it, 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 you know, a lot of these discussions aren't about tariffs because that's what traditionally trade has been about tariffs. This was really about um, um, supplanting a lot of the sovereignty of nations in determining health, environmental, and safety rules. And so their strategy worked. And as far as the agreement on agriculture under the World Trade Organization, Cargill pretty much wrote those policies. And um, the U.S., of course, with the support of the Clinton administration, uh, was able to force first NAFTA, North America Free Trade Agreement, uh, through uh, Congress and then um, the uh, membership in the World Trade Organization. And, you know, this is a very uh, undemocratic process because it's called fast track. So the president has the authority to do n the negotiation. And when it goes to Congress, there's no debate or discussion about making an agreement that works for people or that anything can be changed. Congress people have to vote it up or down. And this is called fast track. Uh, and it's th this type of trade uh, votes has been going on since the Nixon administration. So of course the U.S. Um, did become a party to these trade agreements. Meant, this meant, uh, as far as food production goes, that a lot of food production could be outsourced because uh, the real goal was being able to produce food where it's cheapest, where labor is cheapest, and where it's most profitable um, to produce food and where, uh, well, let's face it, environmental laws, uh, regulation is not as strict. So, I mean, we can look at the effects of that today just in uh, fruits and vegetables. Today, 50% of fruits are grown overseas, uh, 20 to 30% of vegetables, depending on the year. And, you know, there have been a lot of other uh, enormous effects in terms of food safety and, you know, and, and the effect on uh, um, actually farmers here in the United States who have been pushed out of business. And we hear about the purported benefits in the developing world, but if you really study what's happened there, uh, we see that peasant farmers get pushed off the land, big corporations move in, food is pr produced for export, and it's nothing about uh, feeding people uh, in those countries. Uh, and it's created a, a, a super rich in many of those countries, you know, like we are created or have created here in the United States. So this, um, these trade agreements were a, a major change in how food is produced. And the same companies began to pressure uh, Congress to um, write a farm bill that would get farm policy completely in line with trade policy. 
Now those New Deal programs that I mentioned earlier had continued to be chipped away, but some of the programs still uh, existed. We still had a grain reserve. Actually, the grain reserve used to make money. Um, and the USDA still had some uh, oversight of supply management. Um, there, were, there was a lot of acreage that was taken out of production. I mean, there were still uh, things that were really the last vestiges of those New Deal programs that were still helping to stabilize prices at least somewhat. But the pressure mounted, and in 1996, the Farm Bill, which you'll remember is supposed to pass, uh, be reauthorized about every five years, even though Congress is so dysfunctional today that we can't even get a bad farm bill passed. But uh, still in the mid-1990s, um, farm bills were passing about every five years. So uh, industry, the same uh, economic interests that um, were lobbying um, for the WTO, got together and wrote a bill. They uh, called it Freedom to Farm. Now tell me, any time that the word freedom is attached to a piece of legislation, what does it usually mean? So um, very soon, farmers were calling this legislation freedom to fail, because what it did is it, it took a, a, away um, any of the policies that were in place that kept uh, the overproduction of commodities from happening. Now, who might want overproduction of commodities. Well, let's think about who benefits. Well, uh, grain traders like uh, overproduction of commodities. Food processors like overproduction of commodities, which means cheap prices. Uh, the soda industry likes uh, uh, to have access to cheap uh, commodities. Um, the meat industry likes um, cheap feed. So these are the, the, the main economic interests that really pressed for these changes. And within two years, the price of corn had dropped 50%. The price of soy had dropped 40%. And rural areas, um, the Corn Belt, Iowa, a lot of other states were really suffering uh, because of the low commodity prices. And there was a lot of pressure uh, on Congress to do something that uh, eventually resulted in uh, some subsidy programs that really uh, the main beneficiaries of those, I would say, are the, um, are the big companies who get those uh, cheap commodities. And so um, let's talk a little bit about some of those companies that benefited. Well, you know, Iowa used to be a hog state, right? Everybody knows that Iowa used to be, uh, and still is, a hog producer. But there used to be a lot of family farms in Iowa, diversified farms that produced uh, hogs. And, um, and, you know, other crops as well. They grew their own feed, may have had a small dairy. Some of them had uh, some fruits or vegetables for local consumption. Uh, and a lot of these diversified farms were, you know, making a living when there were a lot of uh, meat packers that they could kind of uh, let compete uh, to buy their animals. Because, you know, if you don't have four or five meat packers to go to, if you only have one meat packer uh, or even two, then how are you going to get a fair price? Because uh, they have a lot of uh, power in the market and farmers needed to be able to, uh, you know, call up, see what the price of hogs were, and then go to the, uh, uh, the place where they could get the best price. Well, what began to happen after the consolidation in the industry, in the meat industry? I mean, that's been a very sad story for a state like Iowa. Um, the consolidation began in the, um, really um, the end of the 1980s, but really into the 1990s under the Clinton administration. And I said I'm going to pick on both political parties. I would say that Bill Clinton's uh, policies about consolidation were some of the worst that we've ever seen uh, in the history of this country. And uh, a lot of the consolidation that happened in the hog industry um, and in the food industry began under the Clinton administration. And so by, uh, in 1997, 30% of hogs were raised on factory farms. 
After the uh, 1996 farm bill and the cheap grains, that meant that uh, the amount of grain that a farmer grew uh, no longer limited the amount of animals. And in fact, to be able to stay in business, uh, they had to have very large uh, hog uh, operations. Well, by 2004, 80% of hogs were raised on factory-style farms, con uh, confined animal feeding operations. By 2007, the last time the USDA really looked at these numbers, 95% of hogs nationally, I'm talking nationally, not in Iowa, were uh, raised on factory farms. And that is a complete, um, a complete, the reason is the consolidation that allowed the meat packing industry to become so consolidated, and then the cheap grains. Uh, that meant that feed was very, very cheap. Now, some other things happened under the Clinton administration that I want to mention because I think they've had a, a, a very dramatic effect on our food system and our political system. And uh, really, to fix our food system, I think we have to fix our political system. Um, I think that if we look at what happened to the media at that time, and some of you are old enough to remember this. Uh, now, the media consolidation had just begun in the 1980s. But when the Clinton administration came into office, I believe that was 92, there were five, um, there were, uh, excuse me, there were 50 large media corporations in the country still. After the uh, Clinton administration left office at the end of their tenure, there were five media companies that were left in this country. So we have media companies that, are, that have very tight relationships uh, and ownership relationships with some of the major corporations in the country. And when you look at the boards of directors of all of these, of the largest companies, whether it's the financial services industry, whether it's the food industry, whether it's uh, fossil fuels, um, they're all interlocking boards of directors where you have a lot of the same people who are on the same boards and, you know, who are making a lot of the decisions. And again, I don't think this is a conspiracy. I think this is how uh, people operate and how, uh, you know, how companies with influential uh, people um, actually coordinate, just like uh, humans in a community uh, get together and develop strategies for their community. So I think this kind of takeover of our media um, isn't very much discussed today. Um, and I think it's one of the most important factors when we look at our kind of anemic political system, and certainly uh, when we look at our, at our food system. So how, what's ended up happening with our food system because of all of this consolidation? Well, today we have 20 food processing companies that control 60% of the brands on the grocery store shelves. And if you don't have a copy of Foodopoly, you can go to the Foodopoly web website, foodopoly.org, and look at the charts from the, from the book and look at um, how few companies control many of your favorite brands, in including the uh, uh, organic brands. And um, I'll just name the, first, the top five. PepsiCo, which owns dozens of mostly junk food, snack food, salty snacks. Uh, Nestle, Kraft, Tyson, the giant meat company, and JBS, the giant Brazilian meat company. Um, and uh, as I've told students earlier today, JBS and Tyson are kind of in a sick race to the finish to see who can be the biggest meat company in the world. And right now, JBS is winning, but you know they keep buying other companies in other countries. And uh, really, we have very few companies that are controlling uh, the way that, uh, that meat is produced. But even as powerful as these uh, 20 food companies are, they are not the top dogs in the food heap. Today, the real driver in consolidation and the driver for low prices 
uh, and a lot of the policy decisions about food are, make, are being made by the grocery industry. And I know that usually people don't think of the grocery industry, but you know, if you do your research, there's actually a large body of evidence that points to how much influence the grocery industry has on food production. And no company is more powerful in the food um, grocery industry than Walmart. Uh, today, one out of three grocery dollars are spent at Walmart. And the Walmart heirs have as much wealth as the bottom 40% of Americans. And to me, that's the metaphor for what's happened to our economic system. You know, an economic system that's supposed to be built on competition, right, but where all public policy has, uh, is driving companies to get larger and larger. And, you know, I think no segment of the country has been more affected by, than rural communities by this drive uh, towards consolidation. And I would bet you that um, most of you who are taking uh, courses in the agricultural departments here aren't taking courses on the impacts of consolidation. So how does the grocery industry have so much influence? Well, let's just take a big company like Walmart because really all of the other uh, players in the grocery industry, in fact, all of the big box stores, not just in groceries, but you know, it could be Lowe's in, in hardware, they're all following this strategy. Um, if we're talking about food, Walmart has figured out how to suck the profit up from the ground through the distribution and supply channel into their own coffers. And, you know, like so many of these industries, they've been really good strategists. And they need tremendous volume, right? Uh, Walmart needs a billion pounds of beef every year. They don't want to deal with even 10 different meat packers. They want to deal with a couple of meat packers. They insist on high volume discounts and lower prices every year and they drive their uh, suppliers to, uh, to keep figuring out ways uh, to bring their products to market at a cheaper and cheaper uh, price. Um, if you're a PepsiCo or even a Nestle in the United States, Walmart is a really important piece of your business. Walmart has other choices though and where it can get junk food. So for the, for the uh, um, Processed food companies, Walmart is very important to their business, being able to get uh, access to those markets in their thousands of grocery uh, chains. But for Walmart, they're kind of in the catbird seat, and they require companies to sign uh, a contract that's not up for negotiation. Um, processors, and I'm talking about the biggest suppliers in the country, they um, aren't able to negotiate the kind of packaging or even a lot of the ingredients today of their products. Uh, they can't negotiate uh, what kind of uh, shipping arrangement or uh, the boxing arrangement to get their product into the grocery store. Um, someone who's providing a product for Walmart has to follow it from the field or the manufacturing plant all the way to shelving it at the store. If there is any kind of disruption in getting that product on the shelf, uh, the company gets fined. Um, companies, suppliers are required to use uh, the data systems that Walmart requires, uh, the logistics systems. Um, the largest companies have to invest in radio frequency tags to track their products. I mean, there are a lot of ways that these very, very large companies are squeezing, um, you know, basically the profit out of the, uh, out of the distribution chain. And we all know who suffers the most, right? Um, in food production, it's going to be the farmers who um, suffer the most. And we also know that um, for farmers today, the cost of farming is going way up, right? Uh, the cost of seeds 
You know, I haven't talked a lot about um, the seed industry because I know how controversial it is here with the uh, World Food Prize. But, you know, we basically have three giant seed companies, uh, Monsanto, uh, DuPont, and Syngenta, that control overall in, in the world about 50% of seeds. Uh, the price of seeds is going up dramatically. No matter how you feel about GMOs, the control, the economic control of uh, our most important life-giving seeds is in the hands of a few companies that control the price. And I think just uh, this year in the growing season, um, there was a, about a 10% uh, rise in the cost of seeds. And let's face it, when we were talking about the oversupply of commodities, who benefits from the uh, growing uh, commodities? Well, let's talk about the seed companies that sell the, the chemicals and the seeds. You know, they're some of the biggest beneficiaries uh, of these policies. So, you know, when, uh, a, when the grocery industry puts on the squeeze, who gets hurt the most? Well, it's going to be people at the, uh, in the first uh, part of the supply chain. And, you know, and it's not just the commodity growers, because in writing Foodopoly, I wanted to kind of understand how fruits and vegetables get to market. So I went to the Central Valley of California, because, you know, we always traditionally think that, uh, you know, that's where most of our fruits and vegetables are being grown today, because they have great weather and they have um, subsidized water where they've stolen the water from the northern part of the state and, and piped it to uh, the Central Valley of California. And um, what I learned is that even these large, like thousand acre farms, that's not big enough. Today, the pressure from the consolidated grocery industry is making farms um, have to become much much larger. I'm talking about, you know, 10,000 acres and more, depending on what crop we're talking about. And the most influential um, sector in the Central Valley are the shipper and packers, who have now have a relationship with a lot of the largest growers. And uh, they're heavily capitalized, often uh, by hedge funds. And uh, they have to build uh, a lot of infrastructure, including large warehouses at airports. They have to have a, a, a relationship, either contractual or ownership relationship, with companies overseas. Because for Walmart, you know, it's not about seasonality, even though we hear a lot about uh, fruits and vegetables uh, coming to market because they're in season. Well, a lot of times it's where they can be produced the cheapest. And uh, so these relationships make it possible to procure um, these fruits and vegetables at the cheapest price, you know, um, depending on where that is uh, during any particular year. So it's also had a very chilling effect on how fruits and vegetables come to market. Now, another one of the reasons that I wrote Foodopoly was a lot of times, and I'm not sure if it's true here, but a lot of times in places where I go and talk about the book, people really feel like, well, the way we're really going to get out of this mess that we're in isn't by um, politics or, you know, that's all hopeless. Uh, the only thing, way we're going to really get out of this mess is to grow our food locally and, you know, we're, we're going to build a food system from the ground up. Now, I am not dissing local food. I mean, I have a farm. We're... A, you know, we're lucky, we have a, a good-sized CSA, but, you know, only one-third of farms are near a large urban marketplace. And even in the Washington area and the New York area, as more people are getting into direct sales, we're seeing the market shrink because there are only so many farmers markets. There are only so many people who are going to take their time to go and pick up a, a basket of local produce or who actually have the time to cook the produce or to experiment with the different uh, foods that are in season in that locality. So I think that the local food movement is fantastic. It's great for education. It's great for the farmers and consumers that benefit from it. But I don't think we're going to 
change the systemic problems with our food system uh, through just uh, local production. They're going to need to be a lot of policy changes to re-regionalize food production. And that means a lot of political changes, right? Because we know how to do these things. Really, we know um, uh, we have a lot of the information. We know climate change is going to put increasing pressure on uh, producing food. We just don't have pol the political will to do what is necessary uh, to really change those policies. And that's the real reason I wrote Foodopoly. I wanted to make the case that um, we actually need to get involved in politics. And all of you young people in particular have a really important role uh, in the future if we're really going to have a democracy. Because I think that we are, you know, in a very serious situation where when you have uh, basically just a handful of people uh, and companies controlling elections, that is not good for the future of democracy. And if we really want to change these overwhelming problems in our food system, and I don't just mean the way food is produced or the fact that the food industry has had so much influence on um, a lot of the rules and regulations about how food is produced and you know even the fact that the processed food industry can use um, a, a recipe of fat sugar and salt to addict people to processed food which isn't good to them for them uh, if we're really going to change these things we're going to have to create the political will to do so and that's going to take um, getting involved in politics and uh, really uh, uh, bringing these changes uh, from the community up through the state legislatures and eventually trying to get a better Congress that isn't so dysfunctional. And I know we'll have a lot more discussion about that during our discussion period. Now, there's one last thing that I want to talk about before we kind of open this up and have a, uh, a discussion. And you know, I'm at a, uh, a major university, and I've been talking to students today. And, you know, I know at lots of universities around the nation, there is real pressure on academic freedom. The freedom for professors and for students to actually be able to promote um, the policies that they believe are best and uh, to get involved in civic affairs. Now, I think it's kind of ironic, and you know, I'm probably going to really be stepping out on a, a limb here, and maybe people will throw eggs at me. I don't know. But I, you know, in a state like Iowa, you know, farmers, all of these um, rural communities, farmers are barely making a living. I mean, let's face it. A, a mid-sized farmer in the United States that makes sales between $100,000 and $250,000, that's what USDA says is a mid-sized farm, they make on average $19,300,000 a year, and part of that's from a government subsidy. Now, is that really fair for all of the work that farmers do to be able to um, not to be able to send their kids to college, to have to have a, uh, somebody have an off-farm job. I mean, there's something wrong with an agricultural system, uh, a food system that doesn't allow farmers to make a decent living. And so, I, you know, I have kind of a challenge for folks here. I mean, this is a, a university where a lot of the largest and most powerful um, agribusiness companies have named wings, had wings of um, different buildings named after them, and where there's a lot of uh, pressure basically on students, I think, um, not to maybe look into a lot of the, the deeper problems with the food system. That's what I've heard today. You could probably speak to it uh, better. And, you know, I think it's really important that there be academic freedom on university campuses, that students are encouraged, even if they're going to be scientists, to be active participants in democracy and civic affairs. I mean, think about it. <laughs> Until the 1980s, it was almost unheard of for a professor in science 
to develop something and then get a patent on it and have a company uh, and maintain a uh, position at a university and have a position at a company. So today, uh, people are being told at universities that uh, it's inappropriate to take a position on the most important issues of the day, but it's okay for uh, professors and the leadership of the university to be on corporate boards and to be uh, uh, profiting from, um, you know, a number of the uh, um, economic interests of the companies that they are involved with. So I'm just posing this as kind of a challenge or a question to, you know, talk about it with your friends and uh, uh, people you trust. Because, you know, I think that, that there's something wrong with uh, public policy being for sale, just like there's something wrong with politics being for sale. And we need a really important, um, we need a public space where um, the interests, the economic interests of companies isn't put above the economic interests of people. And I think the university is that kind of space. And I think that the fact that Iowa farmers can't make a living under the regime of a lot of agribus the agribusiness companies that are so influential in this university, uh, that there's something shameful about that, that farmers can't, conventional farmers in the state, I'm not talking about organic farmers, conventional farmers are struggling so hard in Iowa and many other states. So with that, I said I was going to be a little provocative. Um, you know, let's open it up to discussion. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to hear lots of... I think there's going to be a mic. I think there's a mic going around. Well, you know, first of all, I'd have to argue that food is cheap today. And, uh, you know, I don't think the USDA is, a, uh, um, is the agency to really look at the price of food. So we continue to hear that food is cheap. Uh, and there is cheap food available, but mostly food uh, that's cheap today isn't the food that's the best for you, right? And over, let, let me uh, finish my my uh, answer, please. Um, so over the last 10 years, the price of food each year has been increasing about 3%. And that's according to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics that also keeps statistics. And uh, when you look at the percentage of income that people are paying for food, you know, the USDA likes to say it's 7%. Well, they count things like, uh, uh, they count um, health benefits, they count insurance. They put lots of income in that's not discretionary. And when you look at the uh, amount of income that the uh, bottom 40% of Americans spend on food, it's about 35%. And then just get into your, uh, your efficiency argument. You know, I don't think you can look at efficiency just on price. I think we have to look at the environmental and uh, health impacts of a food system that's based on processed food. So, yes. That's a good lead into my uh, comment uh, about the health effects of our food system. Uh, recently, I talked with an individual who served uh, as a district manager for a uh, animal pharmaceutical and human pharmaceutical company for a number of years. This individual shares an office suite with um, one of the vertical integrators for um, um, poultry and hogs here in uh, the Midwest. And this individual told me that the officials working for the company said that recently they have lost 40,000 head of hogs in their company. They're moving operations to other states, um, apparently, to try to mitigate some of that problem. But they said that they don't know what it is that's killing their hogs. 
they don't have anything to fix it. And uh, there's also a poultry operation in my area. The individual has the same kind of problem. His turkeys are dying. They don't know what it is, and they don't have any antibiotics or drugs to fix the problem. So they're worried when uh, winter comes in closer, buildings get closed up, what's going to happen? They feel that there's going to be a large loss of livestock. And like I said, they don't know what it is. And this is getting into our food system. We're going to end up seeing people dying from some kind of new antibiotic resistant organism or what it even is. They don't know yet. Uh, and one of the problems is that's not public knowledge to people. We don't know how much this is really going on out there. You know, we can't quantify it and there's no research because they keep this quiet. And can you give us some insight in how to break this cycle? Well, you know, I think um, it is building political power and putting pressure on the administration to have our regulatory agencies do a better job. And that is, par it is possible because I know we've been campaigning on arsenic and chicken feed. In fact, we had a, a, a big campaign, Food and Water Watch, in Maryland where uh, a big, pretty good-sized percentage of poultry is grown to get arsenic out of chicken feed. Now, the FDA has known this is a problem for years. You know, arsenic is used to make poultry kind of pink, you know, that kind of pink translucent look. If you see poultry with that look, don't eat it. Um, and um, it also increases production. Well, after hammering on the agency, different groups, uh, for about 10 years, last week they announced that they're taking uh, three of the main arsenic drugs out of poultry feed. So, you know, it is the hard work of putting pressure and bringing these food issues to light. And I don't know what's killing those hogs, but I do know that raising animals in such close confinement um, is, you know, brings a lot of disease and a lot of other impacts on the animals as well. And that this whole system of agriculture that's built on uh, low doses of antibiotics has to change, right? I mean, it has to change because our most important drugs uh, they're, they're losing their efficacy. Eighty percent of antibiotics in this country are used in uh, producing animals. And, you know, that's a real problem, and I think we're going to see a lot of dramatic change have to hap happen with the uh, uh, antibiotic-resistant um, diseases that are increasing, MRSA and other diseases. So, you know, it is transparency. It's getting this issue out there. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about this uh, die-off if it does, in fact, uh, affect a lot of animals. I mean, I know we read the trade press uh, very religiously, and that's where you really find out about these things. Any other comments or questions? I have another question. Would you like to identify yourself? Well, you know, I think you're getting really into geopolitics, and I, you know, I think uh, a lot of the fossil fuel policies that we have uh, in this country, I mean, we're about to sign a trade agreement, which I think gets right to your point, that's going to also have a very important effect on uh, energy policy and food policy. And I think that this is an issue that we could actually do something about. And I know people uh, want issues that they can actually do something about. So this is a, uh, uh, another trade agreement that's being negotiated by uh, the Obama administration. It's called the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it's being negotiated with 12 um, countries in the Pacific. But part of why it's being negotiated is 
a lot of the economic interests that thought they were going to benefit from the World Trade Organization are frustrated, especially around agriculture, because they haven't been able to use the WTO to completely uh, uh, break health and uh, environment and uh, safety measures in some countries. And there's a big pushback from a lot of the bigger developing countries. So now the idea is to have this trade agreement in the Pacific that in the beginning only these 12 countries, the U.S. being one of them, would be um, uh, covered, but after it was negotiated, every country in the world could actually join, including uh, China and, you know, any country. And this is less, even though it's being called a trade agreement, it's really not very much about tariffs. It's really very much about uh, not, about homogenizing um, environmental health and safety rules to the lowest common denominator. And uh, for instance, you know, one of the ways that I can see that it would be a, uh, affect food issues is, let's say a state decided that 10% of their food should come from local food. Well, under this trade agreement, which has a provision to allow companies to sue governments, local governments, state governments, federal governments, um, that could be a profit-taking um, endeavor and they could be sued for it. Uh, it's going to encourage uh, the continued um, export of uh, natural gas. There's a lot of pressure to frack in this country for natural gas that has a lot of environmental um, impacts. And uh, Japan and many, a, a number of other countries uh, want to buy natural gas. So we hear about fracking and that our energy policy is about energy independence, but you know, that's, that's really not true. It's really about the energy companies being able to sell their product uh, wherever uh, it could be most profitable. And so, uh, you know, the, the pollution is produced here and then we export um, the uh, uh, gas uh, to other countries. So this trade agreement, like all trade agreements, you should look into it. Uh, there are a number of good websites. You can go to ours at foodandwaterwatch.org, or uh, Public Citizen actually has a lot of excellent materials on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the way this bill, this trade agreement's going to be uh, defeated is in, in the House of Representatives, and we need to call those legislators who talk about national sovereignty and a lot of the issues you're talking about, um, and uh, tell them to stand by what, what they say they believe in, and let's maintain our national sovereignty and let other countries maintain their national sovereignty and not have trade agreements where uh, international bodies with no accountability are making the rules that everybody else has to abide by. And uh, so, I, you know, I think that's going to be a big debate in uh, next year's Congress, and I think there are going to be uh, legislators all over the country uh, that are going to need to hear from their constituents about that. Come on up. <laughs> I have two questions. Okay. First, your comment at the end of your presentation about average farm size of $150,000 to $250,000, that's 15 to 25 acres at today's going rate. That's how the, that's the USDA's number. I didn't make that number up. That's what the USDA considers a mid-sized farm. Okay. And, a, and let me give you all the statistics so your comment is based on the USDA's uh, numbers. A, a large farm is fi it's 500,000, um, over 500,000 uh, dollars to, I think it's a million, and then over a million, they're um, about 115,000 farms in the U.S that have over a million dollars in sales, and they comprise about 73% of the market. So those are the USDA's numbers. And you know that large farm? A large farm, um, the farmer gets um, about $52,000 a year, you know? So just so, I mean, I'm, I'm using USDA statistics. Okay, and then second comment. S second comment, um, you said from one of the previous questions that uh, confinement operations aren't 
a good idea. How else are we supposed to feed the growing population if we can't confine animals? Well, you know, first of all, I don't think confinement is about feeding the population. If, if we were talking about feeding the population, we would be talking about re-regionalizing the food system and having federal farm policies that allow farmers to make a living because I know why people have contract agriculture. You're right. If you don't have a very large farm today, you can't survive uh, in the Midwest where you're growing commodity crops or you have uh, uh, confinement operations. I know, I know why this is and I'm not really criticizing the people who are doing it. I'm criticizing the policies that have forced farmers into um, these kinds of operations. You know, feeding people means that we have to have the kind of food system that really nourishes people. And today, if you're talking about commodities, most of these commodities are going into processed food, which isn't the kind of food that we should be eating primarily. I mean, we should be eating uh, less meat, uh, more fruits and vegetables, lots of whole grains. We shouldn't be eating processed food. Um, processed food is creating a health crisis and obesity. And I think if we actually did the, uh, the numbers on the uh, epidemic of health problems, the environmental problems um, caused by confinement and a lot of the, uh, the chemicals that are being used in agribusiness, that the numbers would show that actually the way that we're doing agriculture today isn't even economically efficient. So I'm really arguing over a transition into having a kind of more regional agriculture, and I don't have all the answers about how to do that, but the, the benefits uh, for, the economic benefits for growing food, you know, farmers should get more than 16 cents out of every dollar, and if you're talking about corn, what is it, three cents out of a box of corn flakes? I mean, to me, that's outrageous. We should be, we should have a food system where Farmers are actually uh, able to reap a lot of the benefits um, from growing food, and where we should have a fair democracy where people have a living wage, and we don't have to have make ch food cheaper to feed people, but people have wages so they can afford food. Now I know that's in the future, but I mean that's those are the policies I'm arguing about. We had seven dollar and fifty cent corn last year, so I mean I know we came home back with a profit, a very good profit. Some parts of the country are making a profit from corn today because of ethanol. Lots of parts of the country aren't there because of drought, uh, because if you're not a very large operation with the cost of fuel, seeds, borrowing money, uh, equipment, I can tell you farmers, are there any other farmers in this audience? Are farmers making a good living? Yeah, we are. We've 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 got we've got we've got 360 acres of corn at home, and we've never struggled. Well, a lot ever. of farmers, I can tell you, are struggling. Yeah, exactly. If I'm not talking about. I'm talking about USDA statistics. I'm talking about. Yes, would you like to make a comment? Right now. times isn't going to be around much longer. And uh, the grain farmer is at the mercy of the large hog factories, the chicken factories, poultry factories, and dairy factories. So this is what's going to happen. And I've seen some of the greatest soil loss of my life this year. And I've never seen them all my time that I was farming. I'm ready now. But this is not sustainable. Believe me, it's not sustainable. A lot of machinery costs, a lot of new buildings went up to store this grain, but now the piper's coming down the line. 
Let's take people in order. If you have a question or a comment, get in line between, behind these other people who have been standing in, in line. Okay, next. Hi, <clears throat> I'm on the other, the other side. <laughs> and I would like to give you a challenge, Winona. Um, I have read your book and loved it. Um, in Iowa, <laughs> we are covered with CAFOs compared to the other, the CAFOs are the confined an feeding, animal feeding operations. And when you look at the EPA, when you look into the EPA District 7, that's Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri. And Iowa is plastered with them, and this is from 2009. The EPA numbers from 2013, Iowa has 3,055 confined animal operations in Iowa. The next one is Nebraska, and they only had 862. And then it goes down from there. So Iowa is actually being saturated with these huge animal confinements. And it is actually destroying the quality of our air, the quality of our water. Not, it's not all water. I know that it's a lot of fertilizer, et cetera, but it can't help it. <laughs> and it also is um, ruining our property values. And in Iowa, 66 counties decreased in population. And I think it has to do with these. I know that I live next to 5,000 hogs from a corporation out of, of North Carolina. And I want to move. It stinks at my house. And it's not, you know, I, I shouldn't have to suffer like that. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share that if you want to do something for Iowa, <laughs> save us <laughs> from all of this corporation taking control of Iowa and Iowa agriculture, or the, yeah, the Iowa agriculture. And uh, you're right, the state legislation and the state politics is where we have to start. And we have got to change who has control of our state. Is it corporations or is it farmers and Iowans? Huh? Well, I'm going to give a shout out to one of the groups that was involved in putting tonight together. Um, Iowa, yeah, Iowa CCI, Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement, that is uh, fighting factory farms all over the state and has, uh, um, can somebody shout out the number of factory farms that were stopped last year? I think it was 12, but I couldn't remember the statistic tonight. But a lot of people have asked me how to get involved in these issues. And I think uh, Iowa CCI is one really good way to get involved. I think the uh, Iowa Farmers Union that is trying to take back agriculture for farmers is another excellent organization to get involved in. Uh, and not only farmers can be members. I know Food and Water Watch, uh, we have an office in Iowa. We like to give people uh, an opportunity to get involved, even if they don't have a lot of time. There are a lot of things that you can do. Go to our website or see uh, Matt, who uh, uh, has a table in the back. There are lots of things going on right here in Iowa that people can get involved in. And uh, you know that's what it's going to take, right? It's changing state by state. And uh, that means uh, connecting issues uh, to politics. So I let's had, take one more question, since I there's had, one more. Oh, we have two more. Somebody okay. else is waiting. OK. I had a quick question about like gluten-free products, you know, like because they're so much more expensive than like, like regular products. And does that have to do with like um, the, you know, corn? Because a lot of the grains in the gluten-free products, you know, I don't think it necessarily costs more to produce those, like, or does it? Well, gluten comes from wheat. Yes. And um, so a lot of the uh, products that are gluten-free, some of them are just being remarketed as 
gluten-free. I mean, I've seen uh, fruit and vegetable products uh, labeled <laughs> gluten-free. So I think there's a lot of marketing involved in the price uh, being raised. And I really can't answer the question about the bread and the actual wheat products that are being made. I suspect that it has a lot to do with marketing, yeah. but it may cost slightly more to do the processing. Well, because I know a loaf of bread costs like five bucks. A gluten-free loaf of bread costs five bucks, where a regular loaf of bread costs like a dollar twenty-five. Yeah, but a lot of that dot bread at a dollar twenty-five doesn't shouldn't be called bread. You know, yeah. I mean, a loaf of bread um, should five cost five dollars, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, one more question or comment. I'd like to. Support like to support your uh, idea on, on your diet of fruits and vegetables. Uh, I grew up on a farm eating meat, dairy, and eggs. Six, six years ago, seven years ago, I was uh, laying in the hospital right now with triple bypass heart surgery. I completely changed my diet. I don't eat the, fruit, uh, the meat, dairy, and eggs anymore. I come home. Right now, I take no medication. Uh, I ran 14... Uh, 5Ks this year and one triathlon wow. with, 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 no, with no heart medication, so I don't need Obamacare, <laughs> and I feel, I feel better than I have for a long time. I'll be 60 in a, in, by the end of next week, so you can't tell me changing the diet it hasn't made a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I think eating sensibly is one of the things that we all have to do for ourselves and our families. And, you know, we all know what we need to do to eat. Low-fat diet, not very much sugar or sweets, lots of fruits and vegetables and grains, not too much high-fat uh, products if, if you eat meat and dairy. So I don't tell people what to eat, but except not to eat processed food, right? Processed food is just plain bad for you. Thanks so much for coming tonight.